So. So friends, uh, good evening to all. My dear uh, vice chancellors, the uh, senior faculty of the universities, the scientists of ICAR, and my most favorite uh, dear students of uh, agriculture universities. I hope uh, you are all keeping good health, uh, taking care of yourself, your families, and following the directions and advice and various regulatory bodies during this COVID-19 pandemic. Friends, the COVID-19 pandemic poses an extraordinary challenge to the world. Currently, the affecting, it is affecting more than 200 countries and territories. The virus has affected the lives everywhere, placing a huge strain on often already overburdened health and education system. The, I'm just recording. Okay. Uh, the precautionary measures of staying home and social distancing has transcended ourselves from thinking words like I or me to we and us. I find it's a very uh, significant change. Sooner rather than later, we have understood the power of togetherness because of this. We have in India about 993 universities in the country and about 39,931 colleges, which is such a huge education system. We have about 3 crore 73 lakh students in these universities. We have uh, more than 47,000 foreign students from 164 countries studying in India. About 48.6% in higher education are female students. It's a very good sign that more and more uh, girls are being educated now. If you see agriculture, we have about 71 agricultural universities and three central universities having agriculture faculty. So in total, we have around 74 universities in India. About two lakh students are pursuing various courses like undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD programs in these universities, agricultural universities. This COVID-19 has affected the system. The Indian Council of Agriculture Research has issued many advisories to agricultural universities regarding alternative methods of examination, online classes, and pursue the research work, which is very important in the agriculture in different KBKs and different ICR institutes and some nearby universities. Now, I think this is time that we have to live with COVID. We have to adjust ourselves that how to live with COVID. We cannot permanently live in this lockdown. During this pandemic, people have realized the importance of agriculture as farmers has also been a corona warrior. Think if there was no sufficient food to feed our 130 crore population. The role of ICR, though uh, through its extensive research has been able to increase food gain by 5.6 times, horticulture crops by 10, eight times, milk by 10.4 times and X by 52.9 times since 1950 to 2017, 18, by making a visible impact. Thus, I can say that the agriculture research and education system becomes crucial to take our population out of any kind of malnutrition, undernutrition, hunger, and economic security of our Annadatta, the farmer. Friends, we have with us today Dr. Pratiba Jolly, who served as principal Miranda House, a premier college for women at University of Delhi, a post she held for 14 years from April 2005 till February 2019. So we welcome uh, Dr. Pratiba Jolly, Madam, for accepting our request and to share her views. Uh, Miranda House received All India Rank 1 under National Institutional Ranking Framework 
for three successive years in 2019, 18, and 2017. Dr. Jolly has wide-ranging synergetic contributions. She is passionate about uh, engendering change, early adoption of new technologies, faculty development, capacity building of women in science, and leadership roles, entrepreneurship activities, mentoring diverse student populations, creating technology enhanced active teaching learning environment, promoting project-based learning, interdisciplinary undergraduate research, and helping students build successful careers. She is going to talk on science, society, and exponential change, reimagining the future. The, the crisis of COVID-19 on the manifold of digital technologies, organizations, and society at large have been nudged on board a new normal. Underpinning the new ways of doing things is the spectacular evolution of computing power that is irrevocably changing the structure of organizations and business alike. Rapid diffusion of technological tools and service, digital transformation and progression of to a highly networked knowledge-based society is now clearly discernible to society at large. The presentation will include visualization of a smart future driven by fourth industrial evolution by change 4.0. It will highlight that research on the frontiers and transformative technological innovation be these in bioinformatics, biotechnology, genetic analysis, robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence or space exploration are no longer limited to prestigious institutions or large organizations. Small science projects also have the potential for disruptive transformation. Young students and budding scientists are important stakeholders. Transformative changes in the education ecosystems will hold the key to the future. We wanted to listen to her uh, during our vice chancellor's conference during the January, but it could not materialize because of some administrative reasons. And we never thought that we will choose such a topic and the entire world is going to change in these two months. So thank you very much, madam. And our entire team, entire fraternity is just waiting to listen to you, to listen to your vo voice and listen to your uh, ideas. Uh, friends, uh, our Director General, Dr. Mohapatra uh, will be also joining. Uh, there is some internet problem uh, at his residence. So thank you, uh, Madam, and over to you, Dr. Pradwaj. Namaskar, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Agarwal, and uh, I was looking forward to um, meeting with Dr. Mohapatra on this platform, but I understand that there is a glitch right now, and uh, my greetings to all the uh, uh, distinguished vice chancellors and the faculty of uh, um, the agricultural universities and associated institutions and their students. Um, I'm not able to see all of you or uh, uh, I'm not able to uh, <clears throat> uh, launch a chat, but I hope that uh, my voice is clear. Uh, despite a little instability in the internet, I will be using a PowerPoint largely. And uh, you know, when I was invited to speak to this August gathering, I was wondering what do I have to say that uh, would be new for this group? especially because you know you are on the forefronts of innovation and uh, so you will um, I will take the liberty of presenting uh, my point of view and telling a story because probably telling a story is the best way in which I communicate and I will try to weave in my experiences which are largely in the field of education. I will also try to weave in my own fascination for a long time with exponential technologies. And uh, my journey was in 1980 when I started making the first set of sensor-based data acquisition systems, working with students uh, on uh, project-based learning. But that is not what I'll be speaking on today, but I hope to create a collage of uh, the way our world is changing. 
And I will now start sharing my PowerPoint because I do believe that that will uh, give you some kind of a visualization. I do not focus too much on what is written. It is really a movie running in the background as I speak to you. And I'm really happy to connect with this uh, wonderful group. Um, so let me just launch first. Uh, I hope I'm audible and I hope that the PowerPoint is uh, 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 being seen now. Um, Dr. Agarwal, may I request you to, uh, at least on my screen, both our uh, video windows are being seen. If they can be moved to the side so that they are not lying on the PowerPoint, that will be a big help. So I don't know if that layout can... Uh, that can be controlled by you. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So yeah, just okay. click on this single uh, icon at the top. Yeah, yeah, I have that now. Yes. So, um, but it is not visible to the viewers. Okay, so that's fine. So let me begin by saying I hope uh, uh, that uh, you and your families are safe and uh, actually working from home, you are far more engaged and busier than ever before. And you're discovering a very new aspect of your own uh, uh, passion and your focus uh, with work and uh, uh, you know many other interesting things. I'm finding that I'm busier than before and I'm doing what I love best. I'm being a student now. And so it is really very interesting that one has got all the opportunity now to look at many things. So thank you so much for being the innovators and keeping the food supply chains alive. And it was music to my ears when for um, other, um, you know, when Prime Minister announced very big schemes for the farmers and uh, underpinning uh, their success is uh, certainly organizations such as ICAR. And uh, many times somehow it goes unsung. It is not as visible maybe as when, you know, ISRO is when we send uh, a mission to the moon or the Mars. And very frequently we forget to honor those who are in fact responsible for uh, providing to us all the essentials that keep us alive. I'd also like to say that I'm really grateful to the strides that uh, uh, science has made and uh, with precision weather forecasts and disaster preparations, as uh, a super cyclone Emphan is raging and it is hitting the coast of our country to the east, I hope that uh, lives will be saved. So such is the impact of science and uh, the way we have progressed over the last few decades is something that is remarkable. We very often forget to uh, uh, you know, celebrate our own achievements. And that is extremely important that, you know, each moment we realize that our country is changing. So as we speak today, I will be talking about the innovation and the transformation, particularly um, that uh, science and technology has brought in and the exponential change that we've been talking about for a long time. And it took a virus to accelerate this. It took a pause button to reboot us to a very different normal. And I think that from here on, there will be only turbo um, charged uh, world accelerating along the direction which for a long time we had been seeing is coming, coming coming and coming. So here we are, we are already into the future. I used to use the uh, phrase future is here very frequently, but it was, I realized the rhetoric. It is now that we are really going to go on to that roller coaster and there's no looking back. We are going to move forward for the uh, uh, benefit of humanity. So I will speak of exponential technologies and disruptive innovation. I will also weave in how aspirations and goals of people and governments have been changing. The world of work has been changing without our really articulating these changes in a very deliberate, well-informed way. And since I come from education and I'm passionate uh, about science education and research and innovation in science education, I will try to weave in various paradigms which are now changing the ecosystem and transforming learning. And for mainstreaming of any innovative practice and for transformation to take root, it is extremely important to build a community of practice. And as Dr. Agarwal said, suddenly we find that togetherness, a change in the vocabulary, everybody now has an experiential understanding of the vocabulary of exponential technologies and the strides science and technology has made of disruption. 
as we have been saying for a long time, you know, India uh, missed the Silicon Revolution, but we were very keen and over the last uh, decade and more, we've been working towards being a knowledge society. The new ways of knowing, of learning and sharing, the new skills and instruments, and these new skills and instruments, these new ways of being in the country have actually helped us to negotiate with the crisis on hand. And as the pandemic has uh, moved, uh, no one thought that with relative ease, we would onboard technology and digital platforms. But here we are, we have done that. And uh, in a much more focused way, we today have this conference. And uh, mm, I think uh, we're making uh, better use of our uh, communication than we ever did before. And these times have been changing. The country has been speaking of innovation for a long time and all institutions and entities and organizations have been experiencing it. Even though some of us have been a little skeptical about it given our 1.3 billion uh, population, but the percolation and diffusion of these technologies and the benefits are for all to see. We've been speaking of digital India and uh, the uh, way the uh, diffusion of these technologies has been not enough, surely, but it is what has saved us in these times. We've been speaking of solar energy, startup India, make in India, and of course, we're talking of e-governance. All institutions today seem to be connected uh, with data, uh, whether it be through ASHA or uh, other uh, um, financial portals, uh, we are connected in uh, far more uh, better ways than uh, we were, let's say, a decade ago. And in this, Indian science has been on the global frontiers. We have carved a place for us, whether it be um, at CERN uh, in our search uh, uh, for uh, uh, particles, uh, high energy particles, or whether it be our mission to the moon or to the Mars and so on, whether it be the mega projects in plasma or it be uh, exploring the space. And uh, in biosenses in particular, there have been spectacular strides and that is helping us to build an innovation nation. And in, uh, uh, I've taken this from the cover of DBT, uh, celebratory book. Uh, it is impossible in a short duration talk to speak of the spectacular strides that have been made by DBT, by ICAR, by um, medical um, uh, uh, profession, and uh, so on. And uh, it suffice it to say that we have, over the years, made such deep strides, and we have also moved towards enterprise and innovation, that today we stand our own, on our own feet given the green revolution, the white revolution, and now these almost every day, something new coming up has been so heartening. We have been speaking of a smart future, whether we speak of smart cities, those projects, if you were to look at it in detail, are extremely educated. And uh, we have been speaking, in fact, as we improve our infrastructure, as we look at our heritage and we strengthen even our traditional systems, we have been investing in human and social capital. And fueling all this, we hope that a sustainable economic development model would emerge that would give high quality life or urban life even in rural areas. And that we would have the uh, wisdom and sagacity to manage our natural resources. Underpinning all this is a participatory action and engagement, which has been very important to connect with people. And I was very happy to hear Dr. Agarwal speak about the importance of communities and participatory action, which in case of ICAR, I think is it's a, a, a cornerstone. It is, one, it is the strongest pillar on which it rests. So given this smart future, it is no surprise that you know, we find that suddenly uh, this month it was reported that rural India has overtaken urban India in its digital connections. And that India per se today is the second largest nation after China to have uh, a penetration of uh, um, say internet, smartphones and so on and so forth. And in fact, what is surprising is that the young are the ones who are very much into it and uh, often for gamification and for uh, entertainment, but often also today, of course, for survival. 
Uh, and this kind of uh, diffusion of uh, smart technology has uh, been in one of the most important uh, uh, ri uh, riders on which our progress depends. So that said, we've been working on mobile connectivity. We have uh, uh, maybe 20 billion connected devices. And if the markets open, this number might just go up very, very fast. So the phone cost has been coming down. More are being manufactured in India. They're faster and efficient. And we project about um, uh, a very fast escalation in these devices in the country. Uh, what has also changed is the manner in which computing takes place. Um, when we began, uh, I did my PhD on a computer and uh, um, uh, almost looks like Jurassic ages now, um, but uh, uh, it was in the 70s when an IBM 360 occupied a whole room. And today I have more computing power in my handhelds, my um, tablets and my smartphones and my laptops. And what has changed uh, today tremendously is that everything is available as a service. You do not have to be an expert to start reaping the benefits of these uh, uh, smart technologies. So what we have, of course, is uh, uh, we uh, have, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, these platforms, whether it be operating systems or developer tools, uh, today are giving uh, available to us as a service. We are all into now storing our programs into clouds rather than having huge uh, uh, disk space on our devices as such. And what is further changing is, as I will go along and show that what uh, we have been talking about as artificial intelligence or machine learning and many other things are all today available as a service. They're available uh, at a reasonable cost and you do not have to be yourself a programmer. If you're setting up a company, you do not have to hire uh, a very, very uh, well-trained team of engineers who will build these platforms from scratch. You can move on to your application rather quickly. And this is what is changing the mindset and changing the aspirations. It is giving advantage to India. So there are attractive opportunities. There's a growing demand and increasing investment. And uh, necessarily, there is policy support that is allowing us to move forward. So Indian market, as it is, is really growing uh, exponentially. And uh, it is driven by the... Uh, as I said, the, uh, the penetration of smart technologies, internet and smartphone and digital devices. So we find that the internet users are expected to be, were projected to be about 829 million by 2021. But at the moment we emerge from, reasonably emerge from the pandemic, you will find that the demand for these devices will skyrocket and maybe the entire population um, um, should be empowered with the digital device. So that said, uh, these opportunities uh, have also led to immense e-commerce. So some of us, at least in urban India and tier two and tier three cities are taking advantage of home delivery of many of the essentials. And that has also helped uh, uh, in our control of uh, uh, the pandemic. So as I said, these are going to be very, very important drivers and they give an advantage, an inherent advantage to India for which the country had as it is almost preparing itself over the last decade, especially the last few years. So that impact has also been uh, seen on the Indian startup ecosystem. Today, we have the second largest startup ecosystem in the world, and it has been growing at a speed of 10 to 12% per year. And the number of tech startups has been uh, getting close to 10,000. And many of them are leveraging deep tech. And many of them are now moving towards being unicorns. And this is being enabled by a policy system. The government has been fostering innovation ecosystem. Every other day, a college or university would get, uh, will be nudged by a policy document saying, set up an incubation center, set up an MSME, uh, participate in challenges. 
set up innovation and research centers and set up tinkering labs starting from schools. And so that has nurtured the startup story, uh, created an enabling environment, facilitated open innovation and enhanced practical and applied component in the curriculum. CBSC today has introduced Python. It is introducing artificial intelligence. It is introducing many of the exponential technologies in school. And so colleges now need to rethink that they have to dovetail with a very smart generation of the young that is going to enter the portals of universities. This startup ecosystem has been catering to social change, healthcare, education, financial inclusion, clean tech, agri-tech, energy tech, and many other social aspects. And uh, uh, exponential changes, as you know, of course, ed tech industry has been one of the prime leaders, and it is going to uh, move uh, forward uh, far more rapidly uh, than uh, before. Uh, the demography of startup founders is extremely important for educators such as us, because we find that about 72% are less than 35 years of age, and they're raring to go. And uh, unfortunately, the number of women is yet small, but I expect that in the coming decade, which uh, certainly is going to be a decade also of women, this number is going to increase tremendously. The education profile tends to be largely in uh, about 50% engineering, but education is no bar. I happen to mentor a children's science uh, congress and I find that student of eighth class will walk up and say, you know what, I'm not going to go into college. I'm going to have my own startup. And what will your startup be? It will be on robotics. It will be on this device or that. And that is ever so heartening. The inspiration for these millennials, the one I talked about, are today, they could be Mark Zuckerberg, they could be uh, Amazon uh, founder, uh, Jeff Bezos, it could be Satya Nadella, they could be Sundar Pichai, the world has changed, it could have been Steve Jobs, and so on. And the thinking of this generation, which I call the moonshot generation, is different. They are being nudged by the government, their own role models in their lives and their entrepreneurial histories to aim at global challenges to challenge status quo and ideate radical, to find solution to the grand challenges facing our humanity. And what we considered as science fiction is no longer science fiction, but it is part of a disruptive change. And leading this is, of course, Tesla's Elon Musk uh, and uh, um, with his SpaceX and the various challenges that he proposed. And these challenges democratize participation in very many disruptive technologies. For instance, now, uh, uh, once when he was, uh, was uh, when stuck in a, a bad traffic, he just conceptualized that he would create his own uh, uh, a transport system and called it Hyperloop and made it an open source uh, problem solving for others and call for financers. And that Hyperloop one today is building, also has signed up uh, for building uh, from Mumbai to Pune, um, travel on pods in uh, using magnetic levitation and vacuum closed tubes. And um, uh, because Virgin uh, Richard Banson is uh, uh, investing in it, it is now called the Virgin Happy Loop One. And uh, this may beat the, uh, uh, the bullet train that we were talking about from Mumbai to uh, a city in Gujarat. So the first private lunar mission also was a challenge with the Google Lunar X Prize and with SpaceX participating. And that is where Israel with three entrepreneurs and 50 engineers aimed for this 100 million challenge. And on 21st February, it launched its bare sheet spacecraft. The challenge was to soft land on moon. We all know that it crash landed on moon. And then India was hoping that it would be the third country to soft land on moon, but that was not to be because Chandrayaan 2 uh, also had crashed on moon. And uh, it was uh, uh, something that the very young and uh, people even such as us were all looking forward to, to looking at how well these technologies would now uh, help us to conquer space. Uh, and uh, um, it did not happen, but it kept awake 
many citizens. And citizen science today is so strong in India. And uh, once NASA released images of Vikram Lander, uh, a techie uh, from Chennai at uh, working middle of the night, uh, Shanmukha Subramanian was able to locate where Vikram had landed. And later, of course, it was proved that he had hard landed and not soft landed. And now as Chandrayaan-3 goes to the moon, many of us are looking forward to this largely women-led uh, uh, ISRO mission. And uh, uh, what I find uh, extremely um, personally interesting is that this will also, in one of its stages, have a half-humanoid robot, Yoma Mitra. And these are the kind of things which are inspiring the moonshot generation and exponential technologies are at work, underpin all that I've been talking about. So challenge-based learning has been very, very important and crowdsourcing of solutions has been very important in the growth of exponential technologies. For instance, NASA routinely floats challenges. Its Exploration X Hab challenge uh, motivated uh, young university students to look at space gardening on Mars. And uh, there was a moon to Mars ice and prospecting challenge. And uh, we do know that um, uh, um, uh, some of these uh, solutions have been adopted by NASA. So uh, what uh, Ohio University uh, designed as a low energy, low maintenance water delivery system using wicking and capillary action, a collapsing reservoir, a fluid flow in microgravity and incorporated recycled inedible plant matter uh, into rooting structure for next plant uh, growth cycle, a bioreactor essentially converting waste to a growth substrate has now been implemented by NASA and um, obviously with variations and uh, 3D printing was used in a very big way. So these challenge-based learnings are defining and changing the world in a very big way. And uh, uh, the International Space Station uh, hopes to have its own veggie garden. If you are going to spend months on end in space, you do need your greens and you want to eat fresh. And in fact, uh, the red romaine lettuce was grown in 2015 and Scott, um, astronaut Scott Ellen, I think, yeah, uh, grew the first flowers of zinnia in space. So things have been changing. I also have been lucky to be a part of the mentoring team uh, that sends India team, uh, team India of 25 students from school, uh, the uh, senior school uh, for the Intel Science Engineering Fair. And uh, the awards here run together into millions and millions. Kritik Ramesh, 16 years, designed a very much more accurate and quicker um, system for spinal surgeries. He uh, uh, used artificial intelligence and machine learning based on the data of uh, many of the images of uh, those that needed uh, spine uh, uh, surgeries and so on. And he won 75,000 for it. Solving real problems has been so important. Another student designed uh, a machine to clean high rise buildings. So uh, which just imagine we have so many high rise buildings and mostly they're glass. So how would that be with wind speeds uh, pretty high be cleaned and what would be the cost involved? They have been those that have uh, 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 designed uh, even in Amanak uh, and Inspire uh, programs, uh, very low cost solutions to outstanding problems such as how to retain moisture in uh, the soil. And these could be rural children. So catching them young has been very, very important. Starting young is the do-it-yourself generation. Sarang Sumesh, the youngest robot maker and TED speaker, at three years made his first robot. And at eight years, he was already exhibiting at Silicon Valley. And uh, he made many, many robots of, um, uh, that addressed a particular social need. Our generation, the young generation is to technology born. And one of the very interesting projects was Hole in the Wall, which I happened to witness personally, uh, launched by Dr. Sugata Mitra when he was working at NIIT. All he did was that he created a hole literally in the wall and put up a computer at that time uh, with a touch screen. And uh, on the other side of NIIT office in Kalkaji was a slum and there were children who were uh, going either to government schools or were not going to school at all. 
and without any help or monitoring, they devised their own vocabulary. A cursor was called Kanta, and they managed to surf their way into some of the most entertaining Disney World cartoon sites or others. They learned to save what they downloaded, and this irrevocably changed the meaning of digital learning, how it takes place for the young. And I do think that motivated by this kind of research, the One Child, One Laptop project was uh, floated by MIT Media Lab in 2005. And why am I speaking of these? I'm speaking of this because as we negotiate a pandemic, one of the things that has been heartrending is what about our 1.3 billion of which 70, 80% live in uh, on the margins of uh, digital economy? Do they have access? How will they learn? But even rural economies, even those who are in remote areas today, aspire for the very best of the new technologies. And we owe it to them to give to them almost as a fundamental right, access to not just smartphones and these learning devices, but all exponential technologies. It is a difficult mission because it takes much more than just a school. It takes a whole society to transform our life. There is, once you have a laptop or any digital device, I'm using this metaphorically, there is the power of ownership and learning from each other as in the hole in the wall uh, project. But there are challenges of scale. Uh, the One Child, One Laptop project has uh, uh, widely distributed uh, tablets in uh, uh, Haiti, in the Caribbean, in South Africa, Latin America, and so on. The results, however, have been mixed. In fact, some of them have not been so good. The issues of connectivity, free and open software sources, uh, open source software, and the issue of competence building of teachers and mentors. So reality check is very important, especially for institutions that are working with far far for farmers, ICR institutions. There are challenges and there are opportunities in those challenges. We have for some time been talking of creating world-class excellent systems, but we do know there is a knowledge pyramid. Right to education was introduced only in 2009. We have diversity in population and cultural context. I've already spoken about diversity in excess and equity and problems in uh, accessing resources and systems of access. There is the vernacular problem and so on. So to lay the framework, as I go along with exponential technologies, which one is so passionate about, it is also very important that we remember that we have a huge challenge to see to it that it reaches the last mile in the country, it reaches all our communities. It is an aspirational nation on the move. As already said, that the penetration of internet and smartphones already very high, larger in rural area, is going now to actually see the exponential curve. And these changing demographics, I have witnessed while I was at uh, Miranda House, a premier institution of the country, about 70, 80% students came from outside of Delhi. It is an elite institution, not because it draws uh, those who are economically better off, but because on their own merit, even from the backwater, students make their way into, the, uh, into our institutions. They are aspirational, and therefore it is important that we manage the issues of equity, expansion, and excellence, because the new normal is of a mobile workforce. Watch the migrants as they go back home, the large populations that have built our cities. This organizational flux and the changing demographics of uh, urban India needs to be managed far better. All of them have a change vocabulary. We are today a networked organization, a networked uh, uh, country, and we are irrevocably digitally transformed. But the problems as I have highlighted as we go along as part of my story, the world is cognizant that it needs to do far more. And therefore the sustainable development goals were floated. First the millennium development goals, not, uh, uh, fulfilled and now by 2030 we have a new set of goals and in India we are of course we've been harnessing renewable energy it is so very heartening to see when the use became the first smart city uh, to have 100% renewable energy and harnessed uh, solar wind and so on so forth and for islands uh, it is so important 
to become self-sufficient in energy. And that uh, um, waste to wealth is so important. Uh, recycling of waste is important. So who would have thought it is counterintuitive that in Leh and Ladakh in the uh, Nubra Valley, we would have Tesla's black hole machine, which would just guzzle everything and uh, without any need for electricity and convert it into ceramic ash or fuel. Uh, so it is important. And uh, if you have been for, I was very happy to see that the first time agricultural universities will be as a category part of NIRF. And uh, it is important, therefore, that many of these accreditation and assessment frameworks should change. And interestingly, the higher education, the Times Higher Education has now changed to include the impact of the uh, SDGs. Um, and what uh, institutions are doing to achieve sustainability goals and there are interesting softwares for that. And it would be very interesting if ICAR were to take the lead and to create an assessment accreditation system that includes this in a big way. And once this was included, in fact, it is interesting that many of the Indian universities have done far better than the, on uh, international rankings, the QS rankings. The global grand challenges underpinning the SDGs are still there. I began with the super cyclone for which we have been, we're better prepared, but not totally prepared. We have disaster resilience is a problem. Environment, food, shelter, governance is a problem. And the changing demographics of the young 1.3 billion, all moving towards a new identity is important. We are living actually on a gender gap curve with micro hopes and micro ambitions, micro innovations, and we hope to move towards macro and mega ambitions, it is important. We are also living on the climate change curve, which is exponential. If you were to look at CO2 emissions by the world, they have been growing, uh, they are a major cause of concern. And now we are living on the pandemic curve. And this is where we are. And as a country, we seem to have managed a um, uh, life on this exponential curve rather well. And today the vocabulary of just everybody includes R, that parameter of spread of the uh, uh, disease, and it speaks of flattening of the curve. But on this, as we have met the challenge, resilient and innovative research ecosystem based on exponential technologies has been the um, uh, anchor, uh, anchoring foundation for what we have been able to do the make in India, the public-private partnership, and the speed with which we have in a very resilient manner moved towards uh, our self-sufficiency uh, needs to be uh, looked at. Whether it be PPEs, which we did not make in India to becoming today the second largest uh, country making it, or our participation in developing rapid test kits and in testing vaccines in uh, um, association with UK or uh, with US and being called the world's uh, pharmacy, uh, we, have, we seem to have done rather well for ourselves. The exponential trends in healthcare have been visible for a long time, and we have moved towards personalized therapies. I will not have time to dwell into the uh, scientific uh, basis for each of these, but you would all be very aware. I'm merely running you through a story to see that this is something that is now defining uh, the, our world, and as um, uh, the data is the new God as it is, and uh, uh, we uh, are benefiting a great deal by this. Uh, the medical robotics and telemedicine has now played a big role in uh, the pandemic because uh, uh, Philip uh, Innovation Campus in Bangalore has also uh, introduced this in a big way so that you don't really have to carry patients who are critical to other bigger hospitals, but that you are guided through telemedicine to how to handle it. Drone as a service has worked very well. So Garuda Aerospace, which had uh, in 2016, won the UN Top 10 Social Economic Innovation Award, has helped in disinfecting 26 cities and uh, uh, just through drones. So this technology is important. Everything, whether it be deep UV for disinfection. So now when we return to work, we may find that the color of our metro uh, chamber would have changed and uh, we may have to pass through these kind of sanitization chambers or uh, that you will be blasted by deep UV uh, 
um, uh, for sanitizing offices, hospitals, and so on. It is important, therefore, to understand what is this disruptive change? What is this exponential change? We all know the Moore's law, how computing power has evolved, uh, how um, the size has become smaller, the, um, uh, the uh, prices have become well, and that information revolution has been driven by these uh, in, uh, enhancements in technology. The theoretical framework, if today we look at it, is the six Ds of exponential technology. It was when something, any technology gets digitized, it becomes very disruptive. And we think it's science fiction. For example, Kodak created the first digital camera, but today it is, uh, um, uh, it is bound up business because it did not believe in its own technology. And suddenly today you find that digital uh, cameras have been so disruptive and we have these powerful devices on our phone. Technologies then become demonetized, exponentially dematerialized and democratized. And uh, this hopping on to the Moore curve has been very important. If you were to look at the disruption the new business models have created, for example, Ola and Uber, the Uberization, some of these businesses own no car, but they have uh, in, uh, changed the way we travel or their money has been re removed completely and uh, digital cameras, megapixels are for free. And technology itself has disappeared as I spoke of software as a service, as, as a platform, and it is democratized. It's anyone, anytime, anywhere can access this. The digital twinning, converging of sensors, computers, mobile devices has been driving this exponential change. And we believe that uh, uh, there will be about 75 billion things to be connected, sensors to be connected and devices to be connected uh, in the IoT by 2025, and this is going to increase. So in expanding our human cognition is AI, the big data, machine learning and deep learning, and uh, data has transformed the way we work. Computing, high-speed computing and accurate computing is underpinning all that we have been able to achieve through this. So analytics in anything, in agriculture in a big way, it is going to come in education, in online learning in a very big way, in medicine we are seeing it is very, very important. What happened? Why did it happen? What will happen? What do we do? And these are the kind of new questions which any sector will have to look at. We look at the augmented and virtual reality, I will now move through a little quickly and uh, do not focus too much on what is written, but it is just to remind you that uh, today, uh, virtual and augmented reality is very much a part of what we do and uh, is going to get far more uh, important. In fact, how we use GPS will change and uh, what kind of a view of the street where I walk down will be very different uh, very soon as the real world will be mapped on to my augmented reality world. So we are beginning now to understand the mind and make machines uh, which are so human-like that it is mind-boggling that Google Auto ML project in 2017, AI created its own AI child. That was that AI use was used to create another AI device and it was smarter, outperformed any other human built system. And with this kind of a force, the ethical issues will obviously come in a very big way and uh, what will all become of humans. But the collaborative robot or collaborative AI is going to be important. So the change in the robotics how little children, as I spoke about the young three-year-olds and so on playing with robotics, the tinkering labs in schools using them to great effect are, going to, uh, are, the, are being driven by reduced cost uh, and size of sensors and easy availability of programming languages and interface. They compile libraries which can be accessed and these are changing things. The future of defense is going to be AI and uh, of agriculture, certainly, in uh, very, uh, very interesting ways. In fact, big data and machine learning, satellite imagery is helping for development. You can, sitting on your, uh, uh, in your office, as we are doing now in our homes, uh, look at 
satellite images, detect where vegetation is, what the land features are, where the housing is, and then decide whether we want to plan an infrastructure project or not. This has been uh, happening for a long time. And this imagery is helping agriculture, I know, in a very big way, but it can also help us to track so much more. Drones have been used for agriculture for long but will help us to reach our sustainable development goals. Because imagine trying to uh, plant 500 billion trees by 2060 it would not happen. Imagine monitoring the crop health in real time. You would need something like drones. And uh, uh, we are moving towards artificial photosynthesis. We are moving towards cultiv leaf cultivation systems, uh, which harness solar energy and uh, house uh, um, uh, micro, uh, you know, organic material like algae to simultaneously uh, remove carbon dioxide and also create micronutrients. You have microalgae chandeliers which purify air and so on. I'm not going to dwell much on the agricultural uses, but I draw your attention to what I found very interesting. And instead of making my talk, I was actually reading the World Economic Forum report on innovation to solve the problems in food systems. But you can, of course, uh, uh, I would have much to learn from you in these and uh, so on. What I find extremely interesting is the augmented and additive uh, manufacturing and the 3D printing of just about anything that you can think of. And that is interesting. So last year, as I was dwelling on this, the Notre Dame Cathedral caught fire. And one of the companies that came forward to say they would rebuild proposed 3D printing of the spire using the fallen stone, wood ash, the original material and the new technologies and print up to a precision of 0.1 millimeter. So today you have, you can print capillaries, blood, uh, human or, uh, uh, tissue and uh, so on, but you can also print concrete structures and apartment blocks in 48 hours as was done recently in China at costs which could be as low as $10,000 for huge apartment blocks and so on. So be it the first human heart or be it other things, 3D printing is what is transforming. And the way we view the world has changed completely. We have been speaking of all kinds of imaging, but LIDAR is what is very, very important. And this is very interesting because as we survey uh, and as we look at uh, the world, we need to have very accurate images if we are to build anything. And this revolution is important. And connectivity is important. So IIT Delhi is looking at 5G as well. And this kind of a transformation uh, is disrupting transformation, uh, is disrupting transportation. So Tesla's be it its uh, electrical car or be it its autonomous vehicles, they need the kind of images, let us say, either satellite images or LIDAR technologies provide. The autonomous electrical vehicle um, expectations are exponential. And for sustainable development goals, these are the ones that will come. But driving this change is one other innovation and change that is taking place, which is battery storage. The size of the batteries is decreasing, the cost coming down, and that is what permits us, therefore, to move towards the kind of technologies we are talking about. Harnessing these is important. So let me say the transformative power of these exponential technologies comes not from any single line, not just from just say AI, but from convergence or intersection of several of these technologies. And other innovations that are happening in power electronics, new materials, new chemicals, computation and modeling, material science, sensors, 3D printing. And that is what is accelerating the acceleration and there's no going back. And quantum computing is the new big thing that will help us to do calculations at super speed. In 2011, US Materials Genome Project reminiscent of the Human Genome Project or the Rice Wheat Genome Projects for materials, tried to create an open source AI map of combinations of elements. And from there to find out, predict properties, and then to devise 
new materials. They could be far lighter carbon fiber, and they could be more robust, and so on and so forth. Unless you have these kind of new materials, product development and disruptive transformative changes in the way the world in which we live and the world we live in is not going to happen. So this brings me back to the moonshot thinking and the role of the very young entrepreneurs and even students and institutions in challenging the status quo and ideating the radical. That is important. I will serve with your permission if I can take five minutes. Dr. Agarwal, with your permission, may I take five yeah, minutes? Uh, now, now, Dr. Mahapatra, our Honorable uh, DG is there. Yeah, so may so, I take uh, Dr. Mahapatra five minutes? He's on mute. So education, yeah. however, is the hardest sector to reboot and to reform. However, if this continues to advance one step at a time, we're going to fall exponentially behind the world for which we want to prepare our learners. So engendering skills for the changing workforce is important. And it is important that we look at the disruptive changes in higher education ecosystem to our own benefit. We bring in influx of new technologies. We bring in new pedagogies and modes of learning. And we look at how democratization and decentralization of analytical tools can help us to forge new partnerships. And sometimes we'll do it happily, sometimes we'll have to be nudged. So the push and pull dynamics will be at work. The paradigm shift therefore is the expectations from institutions and their own aspirations. It is important that we should have research and social relevance and that will benefit the students the most. The change is now that our kind of institutions are not there to provide instruction, but they're there to produce innovation, to produce learning. And let me say, therefore, that experiential learning is going to be most important. Project-based learning is going to be most important. And from concrete experience, students can move by reflecting to abstract concepts. And then this iterative cycle of learning has to be adopted Unfortunately, even in the best of institutions, this is not the norm because we tend to teach the way we were taught and this is important. So cognitive apprenticeship where uh, uh, expert models and coaches and provides scaffolding, but gradually transforms and fades as the student is capable of undertaking the projects on his own and becomes the master and is no longer the novice is important. So this ecosystem will thrive only when teaching research in extramural are linked to real world problems and there's a strong synergy between academia and society. It's important. And that we start looking at all processes as design thinking. We look at understand, explore and materialize new ideas, and this is important for training the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs. As we onboard the digital campus, the new normal, learning to learn, upskilling and reskilling will be important. We'll have to get adaptive degrees. No longer would we want those old degrees. Micro-credentials and mini qualifications would be very, very important. And we would build adaptive portfolios working from anywhere and anytime and entrepreneurship would be very important. So I would like to end by saying, we need to adopt the agile mindset, the agile methodology that worked rather well in software production, which is rapid, adaptable, quality driven, cooperative. We work in small teams that iteratively reflect and improve their own processes. We build small and from the small, we go to the big. And agile is not a process, it is a philosophy, it is a culture. So exponential technologies and the agile will make us future ready for the world of work. So thank you so much. I have crossed by one minute and uh, I will uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, our chairman, uh, Dr. Mahapatra. Okay, am I audible? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pratiba. Excellent presentation. I missed uh, initial 15, 20 minutes of your presentation. So 
Uh, should we have some uh, uh, questions or queries by colleagues who are here? Dr. Pativa? Yes, sir, I'll be happy to answer okay. um, what I can because this is a uh, gathering of experts and I'm a yeah. storyteller. No, that's okay. It was wonderful storytelling. So maybe we can uh, uh, open it for any queries, questions, and suggestions. Or whatever. Yes, sir. Yeah. We can invite uh, the questions. Uh, so you can just write your question and we will give it to Dr. Pradeva, uh, please. Others are muted, they can't uh, speak. Eh? To uh, write their question, it's the webinar. So I okay. don't see any question has been posed, only they are chatting. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm just giving a message also. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a message. So, uh, in the meantime, sir, you can uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, give some feedback about this. Uh, uh, yes, I got one question. One, one question. Yeah, madam, you can just respond to that. Yeah, the question has been asked by Dr. Pankaj Kumar Rathod how this mm. method can be possible in India. Uh, Dr. Rathod, I made it a point to give examples of miracles in India. And uh, let us look around ourselves and reflect on the wonderful things that are happening. The very fact that I'm addressing you from the comfort of my own study at home uh, is a miracle. Who would have thought that we would onboard these platforms with so much of ease? So we have been preparing for it. And it is now our moral imperative of those of us who are in institutions and responsible for uh, nurturing the talent of the young, it is our moral imperative that gives to them a creative ecosystem and they move forward. And my prediction is that very quickly, obviously the pandemic is uh, giving some heart-rending sights, but very quickly, the rural in uh, the transformation of rural India will drive transformation in urban India. Be it food or be it other resources. Uh, so uh, another I'm a diehard uh, optimist. Yeah. So, madam, another is from Vinayak uh, Nikam. Uh, so, disruption is always good for society. What but she can see, na? She yes, can I can. I, I have opened the Q and A. So, uh, Vinayak Nikam, uh, uh, I like uh, the idea that you have admitted disruption. No, but you put a question mark. Disruption is always good for society. Well, the technological innovations and the disruptions examples I have given seem to be good for society. For look at that. Um, well, why should we all own a car? It is good that we have shared resources in transportation. Um, that is one example. And uh, why should uh, uh, the rich own all the hotels? Why can't uh, tourism thrive on homestays? And why can't uh, uh, Airbnb uh, uh, OYO rooms uh, thrive? So disruption is often good for society. And uh, like any technology, there is always a flip side. There was this debate that we heard, is nuclear energy good for the world? The answer is how you look at it. So uh, uh, in fact, uh, for any technology, you will see that now if you look at nuclear radiation is helping us give greater, uh, longer shelf life to our food, then certainly that nuclear radiation is good for us. It was a disruptive technology. How will it be possible in India? It seems to be disseminating faster and faster. Look at how you connect with your own farmers. How quickly even an illiterate farmer is able to uh, define a new paradigm which is visual and auditory of communicating with you. Is able to identify without traveling uh, far what is the uh, disease his crop has. These are all disruptions and they're working. Now, uh, any disruption becomes normal. And then a new technology will have to disrupt. For example, Uber now is looking at Uber Elevate or flying cars. 
And uh, much as we have been scoffing at the idea of the demands that flew, but this is what everybody is dreaming of. And look at the way uh, Elon Musk, that serial disruptor and innovator, he's building Hyperloop One, and uh, India signed up for it. Uh, there is an MOU. And uh, I just read that the new uh, party in uh, um, uh, government, uh, because the earlier government had signed it, and uh, they also want to honor this, but you don't know. So, so much is happening. Look at the way our own uh, Prime Minister, um, uh, um, Atam Nirbhar uh, India, uh, has looked at uh, disruptive changes. How? Uh, what I was talking about, getting the young private players, the young students to send maybe a mission to moon and Mars is now allowed. So the societies change. Who needs to change? We. All of us. So a passion and a, a balanced narrative is important. Uh, so if I have not missed an earlier question, so I see Sherry Jacob, uh, how do we ensure a uniform implementation of educational innovation? Uh, uh, well, uh, it's a very, very important and uh, uh, pertinent question, especially in today's time. Uh, so uh, one of the ways uh, uh, we can do this is that uh, we will have to have uh, maybe digital access as a right to education. And I do think that uh, governments will have to think of it. Already Swayam Prabha channel uh, has been announced and they uh, intend to have one channel for every class. Um, so several channels which will uh, send edu uh, uh, educational content on TV and radio has been announced. But as I have said, uh, my interaction with my own student at a premier college in Delhi uh, has been that whatever be the remote area they come from, However economically marginalized they may be, they want as aspirational young uh, uh, population of India, the very best technologies to reach them. All students had a smartphone. And as they go back, I do believe that they need to be agents of change. The cost of smartphones is coming down, India's manufacturing itself. The idea of a, a 5,000 rupee tablet needs to be revived but we have to be very much uh, more generous and we should believe in open source and cooperative shared community work. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam. Uh, I, I also just want to add that uh, today morning only I just spoke to uh, Dr. Mahapatra, our DG. Yes, sir. That uh, we want to have our collaboration with the Swayam. Yes. Because it's very poor. Uh, so we will have the official uh, collaboration now and uh, we will just see and then uh, we also just uh, discussed with the uh, Microsoft and some other uh, teams that how best we can have the online examination also based on the AI. Yes. So that also we are going to have a uh, webinar, uh, seminar. So over to you, madam, please. Yeah, there's an interesting question, uh, which is, uh, is uh, uh, Bimal Mohanty says, having said all this, uh, don't you think nature is smarter than humans? Sure, nature is smarter than humans. So this pandemic is nothing but an ecological uh, phenomena because microorganisms are the largest population in the world. And uh, now we needed, uh, the homo sapiens needed to reflect a bit more on what they were doing to nature. But when now we speak of AI, uh, well, homo sapiens, a creation of nature in the normal uh, evolutionary chain are the ones that are creating now new devices and so on. So it is nature at play. Technology and exponential technologies are also nature at play because our brain power, our cognition has evolved to an extent that we are, as uh, homo sapiens are capable of these innovations. So today, homo sapiens are fighting for their own survival against the microorganism. And we are not going to go down under very easily. Look at the innovation India is producing, the whole world is producing, and it's a marvel. 
you have asked if uh, Chandra Babu Ranganathan, if working from home through online platform is more efficient and resource efficient. I think it is that uh, look at our carbon footprint over the last 60 days of lockdown and the answer is available with you. Efficient, yes, because I find we are much more focused. Somehow I have been learning a lot. I always used to say I want to be a student all my life and I have been uh, enjoying actually uh, doing things. So if you are just looking for some information, you say, oh, so why not just do the whole course? Because if this is an eight week course, but you know, for me, I'm going to do it in eight hours. And I do do it. I'm not doing it for any credential or a badge or whatever, but just for the fun of it and so on. So I think it is far more efficient. And I don't know if you're a student or faculty, um, but forgive me for this, but you will find the answer uh, yourself if you also therefore now channelize your effort towards helping others, creating resource material for others and using your time. So uh, apart from doing all our work from home and appreciating the help that we used to get, we have reduced our carbon footprints, our cities are far better. This is not the, uh, not, uh, we don't want this to be the world for all time to come, but from here in will emerge a new paradigm in which we will live. And uh, I hope it will be a nicer world as uh, Dr. Agarwal began. Uh, it will be more caring, more empathetic and uh, understanding that technology is an enabler and a facilitator and human values will always be important. So as we create chatbots, as we create AI um, uh, driven uh, robots, we are trying to help humanity where uh, human beings cannot go, maybe save uh, people in disaster prone areas or in a fire, uh, machines will help us. But we are trying to, we hope that we will give enlightened emotions to many of our devices um, so that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Professor Ranganathan, thank you. You are the vice chancellor. And uh, so you will, uh, you have a huge responsibility for giving uh, a platform to the moonshot generation in your university. The challenges are very important. The hackathons are important. But what I also feel, and the prime minister has said, is branding is important. The way ISRO and NASA capture the imagination of the young, agriculture being the most important for our survival, we need now to get the young to make their own food, to participate in challenges and uh, make this the, the, uh, you know, the new start on the technology horizon. Uh, in between, Madam, uh, there is a, a person, uh, Jai Rana, who wants to uh, speak something. So, uh, sir, can we allow, he, he wants to ask a question by voice? He's talking okay, hello. question. Hello. This question yes, is... Uh, Jairana, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Jairana is there? Right? Uh, he's, no, I, I think he's, he's muted. He's, he's muted, but I can see his question. How do you yeah, force okay. all technological advancement under current scenario? On one hand, we are talking sustainability and making self-reliant and large migrations are taking place. So don't think we are running a race which has no finishing line. I think it's a heart-rending uh, scenario of the migrants. It is because we did not, we failed to do our duty. We did not think that when they migrated to urban cities to build our cities and work there, we should have provided them decent housing, sh shelter, food, and everything else before we set them out to work. I hope we have learned our lesson and uh, that we will, uh, from this, uh, transform ourselves as a society because India always, at least as part of its rhetoric, says that we care for those who do not have what we have. So uh, another question by uh, uh, Professor Vishwanathan is what kind of technologies are required to teach practical online? Learning by doing is minimized in online. Yes, this is very true. So virtual labs, screen um, uh, experiments, et cetera, and remote control labs will become very important. In fact, if you, um, uh, that these are the new innovations that India needs to invest in is very important because with the sudden lockout, 
So if you had your experiments going on, uh, going on in the greenhouse or on the fields, et cetera, probably if they were sensor based and they could have been automated, you could have uh, carried, continued to carry those out from your, um, your uh, uh, home. But uh, these are not easy solutions, but these are the new things that are going to happen. And uh, uh, practical um, uh, collaborative skill will be very, very important. I hope some of your students, the young students, will uh, come up as a startup and uh, create uh, sensor-based uh, online experimentation, crowdsourcing data. Uh, one of the projects I was doing, one of the last projects I'd undertaken at Miranda House was that I used to say I spent so much creating a, a huge um, uh, hardware backbone of the institution. And then I moved on to saying that my laptop, uh, my um, mobile phone has all the sensors I need. So real time data acquisition can happen on my mobile. And this can also be, uh, the data can be shared, crowdsourced, et cetera, be it on pollution, be it on anything else. And so probably now we need to escalate our uh, mobile as a lab, a lab in my pocket idea. I see that on ICAR site, I was so impressed to see all the mobile apps that you have. So in the times of pandemic, your uh, many of your uh, uh, connect with the uh, community of farmers is still um, uh, glitch free and uh, that channel of communication is intact. Um, there's a question uh, by this is Srinivas Petikam. Can we have a capsule course on, at, at undergraduate level on disruptive thinking? I think yes, it should be there. And uh, uh, I just, uh, um, uh, you know, um, want to, in a, a brief uh, minute, tell you my own story. In 1980s, uh, when I, I used to think that I would uh, uh, also go out for my PhD, but due to certain personal change in circumstance, I gave up my admissions, I did not go. And I got a teaching after my PhD, got a teaching job in Miranda and I trained as a theoretician. Uh, and I hated the lab, which was such a cookbook algorithmic way of doing. And then I thought what you do not like, you need to change. And so I set up a project-based learning lab and I quit a permanent job to uh, take a UGC's contractual post of research scientist. And for 14 years, I worked in Department of Physics, created a lab of my own for undergraduate students and project-based active learning. And we created a whole uh, science online sensor-based data acquisition system. It was a small enterprise, uh, but at that point, the idea and notion of in 80s and 90s of a startup was not there. So let me simply say that uh, 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 disruption happens. So those were disruptive. ICT in education in 80s and 90s, when I was doing it even in 2000, everyone thought it was disruptive. They said, all oh, this is good, but it'll never come in the classroom. Even last year, when we wanted to think of these kind of formats of uh, engagement and meetings and uh, of uh, distance learning, everyone uh, in my educational system was very skeptical and they did not want it. But a sudden pause was announced in the country. And next morning, everyone rebooted on a digital platform, onboarded the digital platform. And so therefore that debate was settled once and for all. And therefore technologies will be as are demanded by our circumstances. And uh, certainly we don't want to go back to a polluted city with high carbon dioxide emission. We should have learned our lesson in the pandemic and we will have to create a sustainable economy, a sustainable future for ourselves. It is too big a job for one individual, but there are many people who are doing this and we need to really, one, introduce disruption in our classrooms through project-based learning. The agile classroom has startups right there with our students and so on, but disruption we must have. Even teams, should cooperative learning also should be disrupted. Every uh, once or two months, you should change the group in collaborative problem solving groups, et cetera. And I do think, you know, I would love to have a disruption and exponential technologies course. Um, uh, I would love to teach it. I would love to have it taught to me and so on. And you can self learn this and develop a passion for it. Because some of the questions are moving a bit rapidly on my screen. Uh, so I, I hope I have not skipped some. And uh, uh, 
Uh, you've asked for some. Uh, yeah, there could be too many questions. So. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. yes sir. Uh, one, one is interesting. I'll repeat. Yes, sir. Uh, that says that uh, what happens to uh, the so many workforces, uh, you know, getting displaced because of these disruptive and digital platforms, uh, you know, particularly in the context of India. So that, that is one interesting question I found. Yes, sir. So the issue of ethics is there. And for a long time, when we spoke of ICT in education, people used to think teachers would make their way out, but they did not, because the human mm. presence is important. But there will be certain aspects like um, uh, additive manufacturing and so on, more efficient, quicker, do it yourself. Uh, which is going to release a lot of time and manpower. But this manpower can be used productively elsewhere. We will also have to learn to retrain our minds for more constructive and creative thought processes so that we actually start creating more disruptive exponential technologies and so on and so forth. So uh, there will be time for greater leisure, for more art and culture, and uh, greater um, engagement. But this is a real question. It cannot be pushed under the rug. The fears are uh, true. But I think judicious use of um, uh, technologies, is uh, of exponential disruptive technologies, is most important in our country. One counter example is, I used to drive my own car, and you used to too, maybe. But when Uber and Ola came, only more people got employed. The, and the way these uh, businesses innovatively have been expanding, just look at the tremendous way in which they move on to also therefore delivering uh, food, delivering services, and so much. So human ingenuity and sense for survival should never be underestimated. We will find other ways of creating more opportunities. Okay. Uh, there could be too many, too many <laughs> questions. Uh, so I think uh, the, the, uh, yeah. 35 more, more, more questions. So, 35 more questions. So this is your uh, choice on how you want to do it. I have time. Okay. So, uh, it is for it our Maybe uh, two, two, three more. So we'll please, finish it I up. I'll try to see if there is something that is new. Uh, uh, um, um, Mr. Chahan has asked about rural uh, India, how we will cope up with it. I do think that ICAR has a very big role because your outreach is to the last mile in the country. And uh, you can find innovative ways. This is when the migrant labor has moved back into the rural habitat. I think uh, this is when we need to use the time to build roads for them, to build community housing for them, and to redefine all of how, um, um, and these people can use their talent to bring in urban facilities into rural areas, but bring in sustainable economic development. This is possible. Um, uh, much disruptive, uh, uh, Mr. Chetapur has asked for what are the examples of disruptive technologies in agriculture. There are too many, and I think they're already being implemented, uh, starting from greater shelf life for all products uh, to sensor-based uh, um, greenhouses. Uh, and even uh, field crops, which are um, 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 watered just as much as they need to be watered, uh, or uh, with auto uh, um, tractors and so on, and uh, hiring of equipment as a uh, uh, service and so on. There are a large number of disruptive things, and agri-tech startups are also very many, and students of our institutions should be encouraged to come up right from day one uh, to uh, addressing these grand challenges. As soon as they enter the course, they should be given that mind framework to do this. So uh, uh, uniform, um, um, 
uh, Sherry Jacob is asking about uniform implementation of educational innovations in all sections of society. Never will we have, even in the most developed uh, countries, uniform implementation of educational innovations. However much we may say that we are uh, uh, inclusive society or inclusive world, it doesn't happen. But if you were to take one example, the smartphone, that has been such a great leveler. And if this smartphone is uh, repackaged with um, uh, you know, all kinds of software for educational users and for uh, facilitating daily life and economies and business, then you would find that its diffusion of this technology would be so rapid. Uh, so one example is that mm, uh, very frequently I would find an Ola Uber uh, driver who would say, I cannot read. Can you please speak out aloud? And he would have uh, activated his, uh, uh, you know, the audio mode with which, and he would be so savvy in handling his smartphone and would never make an error. Uh, without even ever using the text mode to drive his device. So even uh, in rural self-help groups, you will find that women have been marketing their uh, products on Amazon. And so uh, look around for the good examples, the best practice, and have a forum where best practice can be shared and disseminated. This is where uh, percolation of uh, best practice and innovation can take place. And uh, uh, a question is uh, asked about uh, uh, all. Uh, how do you foresee technological? Oh no, this we have answered. Uh, we have answered mostly all this. Okay, what are the challenges you see in building standards in express dynamic life in era of technology? I'm not sure if I'm understanding the context. Building standards is important. Yes, in dynamic life in era of technology. Well, in anything, standards and benchmarking will have to be set, be it personal life, be it in consumption, be it in uh, our uh, social life, and so on and so forth. So the challenges are those that we continue to face as a society and as a community. But I do believe that uh, institution, uh, uh, people such as us, we need to create communities of practice. We need to lead by example. We need to be role models. We need to nurture and facilitate. And uh, 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 a new assessment accreditation, if this is what uh, also comes to mind, is important. And SDGs can become a very important part of um, what um, we're using our disruptive technologies to achieve. Uh, OK, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Pratibha, that could be endless. Yes, and uh, so we would uh, uh, prefer to end yes. here. It's uh, already 5.30. Yes, sir. And, uh, but I must uh, appreciate, I don't know, Dr. Agrawal, uh, you would like to say something uh, uh, before we end? And, uh, and yes. uh, uh, how many vice chancellors, how many other, others have joined? If you can yeah. give, a, uh, yes. give an overview of this. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, despite difficulty in uh, internet and other things, uh, you yeah. could join it, make it. Uh, mm. Sir, uh, total more than 300 uh, uh, persons, they registered for this uh, webinar. Mm. So we tried uh, in a different mode. It's not through video mode, a webinar. Mm. Because mm. in uh, video mode, only 100 persons can join. Mm. So I think uh, this was a first experiment. And uh, Dr. Pratibha Jolly, uh, I think she has done a justice with the topic. She has done, uh, she, she has given... How many vice chancellors are there? Uh, uh, I have not counted, but sir, almost all they registered. And this, uh, mm. today also they have mm. promised that they will... Mm. I personally mm. saw uh, almost all have registered. Mm. So, but because it's a long list, so to search out yeah, many yeah. are the vice chancellors. Yeah, yeah. So, Madam, uh, I can just say that uh, out of the three uh, revolutions which have happened in the world, in the human life, uh, the cognitive, the agriculture, and the scientific, I think uh, now this is the era of uh, scientific revolution. We have all seen the agricultural revolution, uh, which made uh, our life uh, from the foresters to uh, have the uh, habitable places. 
So I think uh, in this uh, science era, we also know that there is a theory of uh, Darwin, that uh, the natural selections. But nowadays, because of the science, everything is intelligently designed. There, there is no natural uh, selection. Whatever you want, have. you can decide. The, 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 the way you want uh, to be designed, everything can be designed. So really, uh, now we have to again rethink, reimagine uh, in this uh, unexpected uh, time which we have got uh, due to this corona. Our research programs, our education system has to be really reoriented. Already I have discussed with the, our DG and he has taken a decision that how to really even education system, I was talking in today morning also, that we cannot have the physical trainings now. I cannot all uh, call all the persons for coming to these winter training programs, summer training programs, faculty training programs, and how to really take up this uh, laboratory work through online mode. So we have to really see through the use of AI and other things, how for the benefit of the students, we can take all these things, how we can have camera uh, AI built in to the camera so that the camera takes of whether the student is cheating or not, how authentic he is, and start giving a warning. All those things now we are experimenting. So with that, uh, from my side, I would uh, like to thank, and it shows that how many questions we have got that really depends how much, uh, how, how uh, well your uh, talk was structured, how well uh, it was having the contents. So uh, that's why we have got so many questions. So thank you from my side, uh, Dr. Padra, madam. Thank you very much. So over to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agrawal. So at the outset, uh, uh, I would have a uh, few points. And uh, uh, the topic, uh, Dr. Pratibha, you have covered is uh, really uh, wonderfully, uh, you know, moving around uh, uh, so many complex issues uh, and weaving so ni nicely. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, your oratory skills are uh, so magnificent that uh, you so nicely put those words and phrases yes. and put uh, very complex issues uh, and uh, aspects uh, and uh, uh, interface them, interlink, interlink them uh, so nicely and wonderfully. Uh, you know, uh, beautiful artisan you are. Uh, in terms of uh, conceiving many complex issues, uh, putting them simplistically, very simply uh, before the audience and describing eloquently, uh, you know, uh, with uh, uh, appropriate words and phrases. Mm -hmm. So that is the power of auditory that you have. And uh, we thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. Uh, with regard to the topic, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, you covered all aspects, uh, whether it is uh, physics or, uh, you know, uh, astronomy or whether it is uh, agriculture uh, and education, of course, and various aspects, uh, you know, you have uh, covered. Uh, so, uh, so that is uh, something which is very difficult to imagine. Uh, your background has been physics and you have been teaching and, uh, but then you have gone into various facets of it and you have studied so much of agriculture also in the process uh, is a vast understanding on various aspects of agriculture. Uh, when you talk about the exponential uh, technologies uh, and uh, you know cited the examples and talked about disruptions and not only disruptions uh, but also uh, you know other aspects of so, you know several these you talked about uh, whether it is uh, digital or deceptive or uh, disruptions or democratizations and demonetizations and so on and so forth. So when you were talking about, and I was thinking that how this disruptive technology, you know, Honorable Prime Minister so strongly believes in this. Uh, you cited the several examples of this, uh, whether it is uh, with regard to the computing and uh, you know, today you talked about quantum computing and how disruptive it would be uh, in times to come uh, and how the sizes have become so small. Uh, in today's world, I talk of any equipments and the mobile and uh, computers and so on and so forth. So in this context, when you cited these examples of uh, you know, application in agriculture, 
uh, for instance, uh, whether it is a drone application or even other applications, uh, several things you talked about in agriculture itself. And uh, uh, there, there are challenges in this and uh, tremendous opportunities. You cited World Economic uh, Forum report and uh, we have studied this and I'm, I'm sure they, the, the, there are several opportunities for us in the field of agriculture uh, to uh, develop disruptive technologies. You rightly said, uh, less water requiring sensor-based automotive uh, kind of uh, tractoring and so on and so forth. Uh, so there is plenty of opportunity to use such technologies. We are still experimenting in many of those. We are going to have uh, guidelines now for use of drones in agriculture. That is, it is not there. We can't use drones. So there are many enabling processes which are also required to use these disruptive technologies, even if they are developed. So, uh, so at this point in time, uh, so these examples are brilliant examples, uh, you know, uh, for uh, uh, talk about, uh, for talking about, first of all, uh, to think about and also implement about uh, uh, and bring in enabling policy uh, so that uh, it, uh, uh, the advantages of this uh, risk the end users. And in today's uh, world, uh, you know, uh, we have so many small marginal farmers, uh, you know, practically uh, having uh, no information about what is happening outside the world and, uh, you know, uh, what happens in disruptive uh, technologies, uh, you know, so they have absolutely no idea. You talked about artificial uh, photosynthesis and, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, 3D printing uh, in, uh, you know, various facets of life, including agriculture. Uh, so, so that is tremendous scope for us to take messages from your, uh, you know, uh, not only scope to take messages, but also, uh, you know, uh, some of these which we are doing to accelerate it, as you said, uh, accelerated acceleration, uh, that is so important for us in our field of operation. Uh, and uh, also some of the areas where we are actually weak, we must really plan about it. I don't know how many of my Deputy Director Generals are attending this particular one. And if we can take lessons, uh, you know, have further discussions and specific issues, and we can actually build our programs, uh, new programs, uh, so that more and more disruptive technologies uh, are developed and implemented in the future. Uh, uh, so unless we do that, we can't really take advantage of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, development. Certainly, uh, disruptive technology use would, uh, would be new normal. Uh, uh, you know, it has started becoming a new normal in some of the areas. Uh, you know, healthcare, and you were talking about personalized uh, medicine and uh, medical robotics, and so on and so forth. So they would be new normal. And in agriculture, uh, in some aspects, it has become, uh, you know, so normal use of disruptive technology. And as we go along, Certainly, it would be new normal uh, in, in, in days and years ahead. So given this, how prepared we are uh, to actually harness the full benefit of these uh, exponential and disruptive uh, technologies. Uh, you did talk about leader and how to really make use of uh, in agriculture. Uh, we have some thinking and 5G. Uh, you know, you did mention uh, it is working and so and there's people are working on this e vehicles, for instance, uh, you know, uh, so many things you talked about, but in the area of agriculture, how do we take really a quantum leap, uh, you know, uh, in planning and executing uh, disruptive uh, technologies, uh, so that uh, our productivity enhances climate resilience enhances uh, the income to the farmers in, uh, increases and our livelihood security is ensured far better than what we have been doing in the past. I think there's plenty of scope for us. I have spoken for uh, you know five minutes, so I don't want to really do this. But last area that you did mention that the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the experiential learning systems, we have uh, uh, thought about it a decade ago and initiated experiential learning systems in our universities. My honorable vice chancellors are here and uh, you know, uh, some of them uh, did interact and ask questions and uh, you know, uh, 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 we learned 
uh, uh, several things, I'm sure. Uh, you know, uh, so how do we actually uh, democratize uh, the learning process? Uh, my daughter was, uh, you know, uh, for the past few days, were taking a course of MIT or for that matter, Harvard or anywhere. So there are so many classes. You can take the classes, learn things, go, go for the exams and get a certificate out of it. So, so many courses. So it has become democratized. You can sit in anywhere, you can learn anything. So, uh, and there are so many models. Uh, Chicago University, I was, I was looking at those what you were studying, you know, dissection of the brain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, to, to see uh, what, which are the parts, uh, the, the kind of uh, learnings and all that, which is being explained there. Uh, so nicely, and we're thinking that probably agriculture cannot be taught, uh, you know, through uh, this mode, but we can still do practicals and then uh, teach the, using this mode. Uh, so so uh, I think uh, there is plenty of uh, things are there for our honorable vice chancellors uh, to take home back and then, uh, you know, uh, through modeling, uh, through uh, reflective and explorative processes uh, in place, uh, we can uh, you know, uh, uh, have uh, better uh, teaching experience, uh, learning experiences rather, and also teaching experiences for the teachers. So, uh, so this, uh, you know, uh, aspect, Dr. Agrawal, uh, we need to really uh, go a bit deeper and then, you know, have further discussion and maybe with other, uh, you know, involving Dr. Pratibha and maybe other experts as well. At the global level, we can, uh, you know, through uh, World Bank uh, programs, we can actually you know, invite others as well, and then see uh, the global expertise wherever is available, and our local expertise all together, uh, we can build our education program in a much better way, and in a much robust way, uh, and then see, you know, we used to talk about smart classrooms, actually, we have, it has gone beyond smart classrooms. And uh, so, so this is uh, where uh, we have to really, uh, you know, uh, put our efforts in. So without uh, taking more time, uh, so uh, this new normal world, uh, COVID has enforced upon us. Dr. Pratibha was uh, telling that because of COVID, we are using these platforms. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, this new normal life, COVID has enforced on us and uh, we will explore it further. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pratibha, for an uh, excellent, uh, you know, uh, presentation and uh, so well uh, you know, uh, uh, covered, uh, so well spoken about, so many different ideas uh, brought onto the table and uh, many different directions uh, you have uh, placed before us to think about, to work about, and uh, also so importantly, agreeing to our request uh, to uh, you know, come on live and then uh, be uh, with our uh, you know, honorable vice chancellors and other young scientists, I see so many young scientists there, uh, you know, uh, Seri Jacob is one and so many others, Dr. Gopal Krishnan was asking a question and uh, so many are there, not so old and not so young, uh, you know, very young as well. So, so many, 300 of them being there and they thoroughly enjoyed, I can perceive that from their reactions, they have already thanked all of you, uh, you know, you might have seen those uh, so thank you very much once again profusely and we will be in touch and we will have further interactions as we go along. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard you uh, at uh, our NAM, I interacted with uh, you at your own uh, college, uh, you invited me for the lecture and mm -hmm. uh, I gave a long lecture and uh, you know, uh, then you know, subsequently uh, we had interaction. So, uh, and we will uh, continue interacting further. So thank you very much. Thanks mm -hmm. to our DDG who organized this. Uh, thank and you. Uh, many are thanking actually Dr. Pratibha. You may please take note. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, sir, you sir, sir still, still, still we have 42 questions to be answered. Uh, no, you, and many you, vice chancellors there, but uh, the time is the limitation. So if you but, will, uh, if there is some, I, I will send you the questions. I will, I will send you the, the remarks can be sent. I would be happy to answer personally. Sure, sure, yeah. So because I will uh, also learn so, from there. These are a, this is a discourse. There yeah. is no. Yeah. So this is this is a new way of uh, delivering the talks. Yes. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, yeah. Continue. We can continue. Yeah. See, we can have two hours, three hours, but uh, yeah. you know, uh, no point. But we yeah. we will take advantage of this uh, medium. Yeah. And so, uh, using this medium, even twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand, any any number of persons can join. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank, thank you very please, much. Everyone, please stay safe and stay happy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.